That is certainly our goal, to learn more about Jesus, to draw closer to him in this class and one another. So thank you for your help. Thank you ahead of time. As I know that uh, many of you will participate in the class with that objective, that main objective. And so please do, please join in. Questions, comments, we welcome those. And uh, thank you also for making this journey with us through Paul's letter to the Romans. There are two mountaintops or two summits that you'll find in Paul's letter to the Romans. They are chapter five and chapter eight. In chapter five in verse one, the apostle Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of, of sin and death. And of course, in both chapters, Paul will go on to uh, show the, the plan of God in the gospel in chapter 8, the amazing benefits of that plan, especially in chapter 8. So these are the two mountaintops in Romans, and Paul invites us to the summit with him in these chapters to behold from uh, his perspective, uh, his Holy Spirit-guided perspective, the amazing wisdom, the magnificent power, the tremendous grace of God in the Bible plan. In Hebrews 11 and verse 1, the Hebrew writer says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The assurance of things hoped for. And then he'll say the conviction of things not seen. And I, I go to Hebrews 11 and verse 1 because the Holy Spirit tells us that faith is not just something you gain knowledge from. It's, we're not just here to gain knowledge of inspired teaching from the Lord. We're here to also uh, increase our hope, the assurance of hope. Faith is that. Uh, faith validates our hope. Faith makes our hope real. And so when we read the word of God, when we go to the pages of God's word and we see such amazing grace, then it should add assurance to our hope that we have in Jesus Christ, what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. And so as we learn, it should increase our hope and validate uh, that hope for us. Romans 5 shows us our faith is real. It will be realized because of the grace of God. The subject of God's grace, we pointed out the last two classes, is often abused. One way it's ab abused is by the libertarian who says that, uh, you know, with such a, a boundless amount of grace from God, we, sh we should just sin all the more, that grace may increase. Let, let God have an opportunity to show his grace. Uh, and so they see that as a license to sin, the libertarian. And then you have the legalist who accuse Paul of that. They accuse Paul, they maybe accuse us of saying, well, that just encourages sin. When you talk about grace this way, and of course, all you're doing is reading what Paul says in uh, Romans, but when you talk about grace in this way, that's just encouraging sin. And Paul says, you know, this is what God has done for us, and without this, you don't have hope. And if, if you are going to be legalistic in that way, Paul says, your condemnation is just. He'll say that in chapter 3. So we, we need to bind and loose where God has bound and loosed. Uh, we don't want to go beyond that. And if he says this about grace, this is, this is the truth about grace. We need to teach that and not worry about the libertarian or the legalist. 
In chapter 6 and uh, in verse 1, Paul, Paul answers both the libertarian and the legalist, and he asks this rhetorical question. He says, are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? So he, he sets it up with that question, and then he answers in the strongest possible terms. Chapter 6 and verse 2, he says, uh, God forbid... Uh, may it never be, certainly not. And then he asked another rhetorical question, how shall we who died to sin live any longer therein? Now you notice he says, we who have died to sin, that's past tense. That's past tense. He assumes we understand that. We died to sin. We understand that we died to sin. It's not that sin died. We died. We died with Christ. Now, when did we die with Christ? Well, the answer is in verse 3. This is all by way of review. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? In verse 4, therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. And so the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, says at baptism, we share in the death of Jesus. His death becomes our death, and therefore death to sin. Now, what does the fact that we died to sin mean? What does that mean? Well, first of all, what does it not mean? The fact that we died with Christ to sin doesn't mean that we don't sin anymore. We do. First uh, John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we're a liar, truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, First John 1, 9. So it doesn't mean we don't sin. We don't live in it, but we will sin still. Um, Neither does it mean, the fact that we died to sin, that we won't be tempted. Being baptized into Christ doesn't mean that we're no longer tempted to sin. We will be tempted. Simon, after he was baptized into Christ, was tempted, and he sinned. Peter, of course, our apostle Jesus Christ, was tempted in a prideful and prejudiced manner, and he sinned. And so even after we're baptized into Christ, we will still be tempted. We are seeking to grow in Christ. We want to hate sin like Christ hates sin and love the things that Christ loves, but we will still be tempted. And it's good to remember, brethren, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, whatever temptation you face, it's common to everybody. Everybody faces that temptation. But some people give in. Don't be one of those who give in to the temptation. So what does it mean to die to sin? It means that we don't live in it. And it means, as Paul will go on to show us, that whatever spiritual blessings and benefits and favors are available in Christ, when were they reached? At what point? At baptism. So faith also uh, will be baptized. If we're, you know, those who received his word were baptized and there were added 3,000 souls. And so at the point of baptism, that's when we come into contact with whatever benefits, spiritual blessings, Christ's death, has available for us, um, of course, including forgiveness of sins and death to a system of law. That's important. We need to always remember Jesus' promise. Remember he said in our study of Matthew, I did not come to destroy, but I came to do what to the law? Came to fulfill it. And did he keep his word? 
Colossians 2, Ephesians 2, his, his words on the cross, it is finished. Everything the Father sent him to accomplish, he accomplished that. He fulfilled the law. Law, a system of law, a system of justification based on law is what gives sin power. That's what gives sin power. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15. Amen. Maybe. Let's see. If it does again, I'll have to go without it. I think that's it. All right, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit louder. And if, if you don't hear me, raise your hand. Faith comes from hearing. And so raise your hand. I'll speak a little louder. But uh, it's important to remember that. Uh... Okay, thank you, brother. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, that in, in, in intertwined in Paul's teaching here about grace. He will frequently talk about the law <coughs> being, being abolished, being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That had to happen. For until that happens, we're still under sin and we're still under death. Okay, that had to happen. So when Paul says we died, we died with Christ when we were baptized. That's assuming we, re we had repented, of course. Uh, and Paul assumes that as well when he says this. But the fact that the law was fulfilled is intertwined in that statement. Let me prove that to you. Uh, he'll say that later on in chapter 6. But look at chapter 7. Look at chapter 7 of Romans. And he'll use marriage here to illustrate this. The main point here is not the covenant marriage, but it's used as an illustration for the main point, which is the fact that we're not under law, a system of laws, justification. So in Romans 7, let me have a good strong reader for the first four verses there, please. Romans 7, 1 through 4. Well, do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. The married woman is bound by law to her husband's wife as if if her husband dies, she is released to the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she should be called an adulteress. When her husband dies, she is free from the law, so, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brother, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Thank you. That is the word of the Lord. Notice, it's not that the law died, brethren. And sometimes this is represented that way. The law was abolished, we know, from Ephesians 2 and Colossians 2 at the cross. But that's not what he's saying here. He didn't say the law died. Who died? We did. We did. We died. We died. And therefore, because we died, we're free because a death has taken place in that former marriage between man and the law because a death has taken place and a rebirth in our case, a re we're reborn in Christ. What are we free to do? Saved by grace and remarried, spiritually married, married to Christ. Uh, so we were connected to that law. We're bound to the law until there's death. Well, we died in Christ. There's a death. And so that, that marriage bond is over. And so now, reborn in Christ, we are married to him. 
uh, all, all of that, of course, spiritually speaking. And so that, that's all intertwined in Paul's teaching there about being free from sin and free from death because the law exposes sin and it brings death. Uh, but in Christ, of course, there's forgiveness of sin and he has conquered death. The Bible has a lot to say about being reborn in Christ. Death to sin and the law in Christ and being reborn in Christ. And the way it will talk about it is from the standpoint of Christ's word being seed. Luke 8, 11, the seed is the word of God. And look at the way Peter talks about it in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1, the seed is the word of God. This is common imagery in the, the Bible. In 1 Peter 1, I love, I love this section of scripture here and uh, its contrast with physical seed and spiritual seed and physical life and eternal life. Uh, give me a good, strong reader. Chapter 1, verse 22 through chapter 2, verse 3, please. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Thank you, brother. It's from the Lord, this teaching here about eternal seed. The seed of God, the word, that is what gives us life. And so that is what we should continue to study because we need to sustain that life. Now that we have life in Christ through this word, this seed, to sustain that life, we've got to continue feeding on that word, you see. And whether we're uh, 13 years old or we're 80 years old, if we just were reborn in Christ, we're babes and we need to grow. All of us need to grow. There's never a point in life we don't need to grow. We can always, there's always room for growth in Christ. But do you see how the seed uh, is, is spiritual in nature? When it's implanted in the heart, it germinates and it produces salvation according to God's grace and uh, we are then reborn we're added to the family of God we're adopted into his family as a son or a daughter in the same way you have physical seed so you have you have the 12 tribes of Israel that physical seed brought about a physical nation you have 12 apostles and their spiritual seed brings about what? A spiritual nation, spiritual Israel, you see. So when Paul says in Romans, as he often does, we died to sin, we have to be reborn. There has to be a new life. And so there is a death to sin through Jesus Christ, but there's also a rebirth and a new life where we're married to him and now we, we continue to grow through the seed of that word. Yes? I think this is where the legalist really just misses it entirely. They believe in God's grace. Mm -hmm. But what they look at is that I'm saved by whatever percentage of the law that I keep. The other bit is not 100%. But wherever I fall short, then God's grace takes me the rest of the way. And that's spiritual adultery. 
Because what they're trying to do is have both both the law and grace working together to okay. save you. Okay. And that's just simply not what Paul was saying. In fact, he's saying the opposite of it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, sometimes an analogy is given of a man on a cliff. He just got to jump across this chasm that's a hundred miles long, miles long. And so he jumps as far as he can. And God finishes up the rest of that jump for him by grace. That's that is not a biblical based analogy. It's just false. Uh, man, man doesn't jump at all. He just trusts God fills in the chasm completely with Jesus. That's it. God fills it in. God puts the bridge. Jesus is the bridge from that side to this side. And that's a fair analogy. That I believe that's biblically based. And, and we trust the bridge and we travel through life based on faith and trust in what God has provided, his gift. Um, anything else, Eddie, you want to add to that? Okay, um, let's go back to Romans 6, if we may. We die to sin in Jesus. We're reborn in Jesus. In Romans 6, then in verse 5, Paul says, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. United in death and resurrection with Jesus, died, and there it is, reborn. So both, both sides are there, the death and the rebirth. Got to have both. Uh, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is free from sin. We died to sin and slavery to sin. The law was fulfilled. And so we're no longer a slave shackled to sin. Brethren, at this point in Christ, you're free to think of yourself as being free. And that's hard to, hard to grasp. That's hard to wrap your head around. Is you're free to think of yourself as being free, no longer shackled to sin. We imprison ourselves in sin. We serve sin. We serve Satan, ultimately. But in Christ, we're set free from sin, and the shackles of sin are removed. And Paul's point is, why do you want to go back into that prison? Why do you want to go back into that spiritual cesspool that you came out of? Uh, gratitude alone should say you don't want to do that. Uh, why would you want to go back to the imprisonment of sin? We're free to enjoy peace now in Christ. Our hope is real. So the first seven verses, the gospel sanctifies, God saves us, and then verses 8 through 23, the remainder of this chapter, uh, we need to live lives in response to what God has done. Once again, that's the pattern that we find in Scripture. Um, every one of Paul's letters, he'll start with grace and peace. He'll, he'll start with what God has done. And then this is what we need to do in response to what God has done. And you see that in the various chapters in the book of Romans. Uh, so verse, uh, verse 8 now of Romans chapter 6. If we have died with Christ, we believe we should also live with him. Now, what, what is this talking about? Is this the bodily resurrection he's talking about here? Christ was raised from the dead. In context, is that what he's talking about? The bodily resurrection. Well, I think he's talking about how we go on living in his life. How we act, the things we do, the things we say. Is there, I would agree with you, brother. And, and what, in context here, this verbal neighborhood, what has already been said that would indicate that? That it's the new life and your godly behavior that we have been raised up with him okay uh, this is already taking place it's it's happening right now isn't it yeah. now you know eventually there will be a resurrection he's the first fruits of that isn't it but here he's talking about i agree i think he's mainly talking about in context raised to walk in newness of life and he's going to go on to say much more about that in the verses that follow that having 
wholeheartedly giving yourself to the Lord, uh, becoming a servant gladly, then that should result in glad service for the remainder of your life. Uh, so when Paul says here, we've died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. Uh, the main point is as a result of God's grace, and we can actually think of ourselves as being free from the shackles of sin and, and having this hope that's real because of God's grace and promise, then let's, let's live a life in accordance with that, with those promises. Uh, Brother Nancy. Yes. Uh, I think a good passage for us to study, uh, study later this week by ourselves uh, is Colossians 2 and Colossians 3 is a good parallel okay. of this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Colossians 3, it, it's the same pattern, basically. Yeah. Um, it's what, again, what God has done for us. And so in chapter 3 uh, and 4, it will be the reasonable and grateful response to what God has done. You know, since Christ has done this and seated you with him in the heavenlies, then uh, how should we live? And it's just one pattern of behavior after another that's godly. Yeah, absolutely. Colossians 3 is, is great for that. Thank you, brother. Anyone else here? Anyone? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I'm just grateful, brother, that you just kept on seeking, you kept on knocking, kept on asking, and God kept on providing. Well, one thing I knew is I wasn't going back to the world. I didn't have a long time. I was working. I was really just got us through one problem. I always think of a little 17. We talk about life. Remember life. I may have told the story, but one little boy in a Bible class heard that story about Lot's wife looking back, and he raised his hand. He said, yes, Jimmy. He said, well, he said, my mother turned back when she was driving, and she turned into a telephone pole. <laughs> he sort of got it. <laughs> yeah. 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 A lot of this, this chapter is on, you know, this is the way you lived. Uh, how did that work out for you? You know, he'll say that later on uh, in Romans 6, doesn't he? Uh, look, on, look ahead in Romans 6 and uh, let's see. About verse... Uh, Verse 21. 21. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, brother. Look, look at this. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you're now ashamed, or should be, for the outcome of those things is death? I mean, if that's not a challenge, I don't know what is. It's a challenge to remember 
your former lifestyle. So how did that go for you? How did that work out for you? Well, drugs, alcohol, betrayal, lying, cheating, uh, sexual immorality, uh, you know, idolatry in one form or another. I mean, some freedom. That's what you call freedom. Uh, and, and so Paul is just making that very point. He says, you know, as, uh, as the proverb says, the way of the transgressor is hard. You know, they say, oh, freedom. No, you just serve a different master. You serve sin, ultimately Satan. And he hates you. He hates you. Yes, you could even include in that the idea of salvation by law. People who try yeah. to be saved by law are miserable. Yeah, yeah that's and true. That misery they live with is, is a part of what Paul is talking about here. But what benefit yeah. was that to live that way? Yeah, that's a good point. And, and those who still try to be saved on the basis of law, uh, which is basically legalism, uh, it's, it's Christ and his sacrifice and something else, me trying to earn a merit some way. It's a, there's no hope there. There's no hope there. And it is a miserable lifestyle. So please, please don't go there. Interesting statement. Yeah, someone could be alone right now in this auditorium in that sense because their mind is thinking, I, I hear this and I hear these wonderful promises of hope. I read them, but I still feel hopeless. And uh, it, it's a matter of faith. It's faith. Do you believe God and what he says here or not? And if you're walking by faith and you're trusting in him, then you should have that hope. If there's some sin in your life you're harboring, you need to get rid of that. You know, you need to stop holding on to that and let it go and let God have his way with you. And you can have that peace in just a moment. If, if you've already been baptized into Christ, you can have that peace. Chris? Uh, there's a whole lot of illustration about the children of Israel uh, leaving Egypt, leaving slavery, and yet constantly wanting to go back. Mm -hmm. Even mentions they turn back in their yeah. hearts. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I mean, I mean, that's a good parallel of that we need to be aware of that temptation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's Paul will talk a lot about that, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. As using them as a, an example of what not to follow, what not to do. And they left Egypt, but Egypt didn't leave them. Still in their hearts. All of us leave Egypt, the Egypt of sin, but is Egypt still in you? Is that sin, sin still in you? You still harbor it. You still desire it. Uh, you need to get rid of it. You also think when you start when you really walk with Jesus, you need to go to not go to places yeah it's good practical advice you know, don't don't see how close you can get to it yeah in Romans uh, 6, verse 9 through 11, Christ is the guarantee of our new life and victory over sin and death. And verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. Christ conquered death. Revelation 1.18, he's holding the keys of death in his hand. Verse 10, for the death that he died, he died to sin. He conquered sin, overcame death once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God and for God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So parallels between Christ and our redemption. Verse 9, God raised Jesus, and what about us? 
raised us. God raised us. He, he raised us. Right now, he's raised us up to walk in newness of life, and, and the resurrection will raise us as well. Jesus overcame, overcame death. What about us? Hmm? We have to, especially if you take into account verse 23. Yeah, go ahead. Wait. Chapter 6, verse 23 uh, reads, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yeah. Chris, I'm glad you're here. You're speaking more than in the members here. Something, something uh, is wrong with that. All right, verse 10. Jesus died to sin. So what does that mean for us? We died to sin through him. He set us free. He set us free from sin. Uh, and then verse 11. He lives to God. What does that mean for us? Thank you, brother. We live to God as well. Um, so verse 12, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. So uh, verses 12 through 23, Paul is going to now e exhort us to live lives that are consistent with all of these facts, with all of these truths. Do not go on presenting, verse 13, the members of your body as instruments of sin and unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And so same word present is the word that will be used oftentimes for an offering that might be given to God, an offering in Romans 12, he'll say, present your bodies, living holy sacrifices unto God, which is a reasonable service of worship. Present your bodies. Uh, the idea of presenting means to yield or to put at someone's disposal, in this case, to put at the disposal of God. Uh, members, what would be the members? Present your members. What would be the thought here? Physical bodies and within mind, the heart, all the faculties, all the abilities that we have, present those unto the Lord, uh, everything. In Romans 12, again, he will say, present your bodies living, holy sacrifices, everything you are. No longer conform to this world, transform in your mind. Uh, instruments, the instruments of your body. Anybody do any research on that term? Present the members of your body as instruments of righteousness. It's, it's oftentimes translated uh, a weapon. It's a military term, a military term. It's oftentimes translated weapon. And uh, can, can Satan use those instruments as weapons? Absolutely. Weapons against you. Weapons against other people. Sin is destructive. And so maybe that's the way it should be translated. Um, how does, what's the imagery Paul uses in Ephesians 6? When he's, when he's talking about us to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Armor. Armor. Shield uh, of righteousness there. The, the, the shield of faith. The sword of the spirit. Helmet of salvation, feet shod with the gospel of peace, girt about with truth. Uh, let's, let's use whatever faculty God has given to us to uh, spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, so in this, uh, this teaching, as well as other here, sin is personified as an evil master, and he's warning us not to go back into the slavery of sin. You can, you can choose sin as your master, or you can choose righteousness as your master. In verse 14, he says, sin shall not be master over you, for you're not under law. There it is. You bring it out again. You're not under law. That is a system of justification based on law, but you're under grace. 
And so Paul's incentive here for obedience to the Lord is what? In verse 14, you're not under what? Law, not under the law. It is fulfilled in Jesus. It is abolished uh, by Jesus Christ. Now we obey Jesus. He is our Lord. We must obey him. He's the source of salvation to all who obey him. But we're not under a system of law uh, as a basis for justification. Dixon, you spoke at the very beginning of the class of the idea that the legalist made the charge against Paul. We're letting people do whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. He's actually pointing out that they have that backwards. It's actually the ones who are saying that we're under a system of law that we're actually encouraging the sin. And Paul is saying, stop listening to that message because you're not under law. Yeah. And recognize that being under grace actually calls you to a higher calling than law does. Yeah. You're not trusting in the Lord. You're not trusting in what he's provided. You're still trusting in yourself if that's the case. And you can't be saved that way. I think like Galatians 2, the love of Galatians 2 as well. And that is that it's, it's uh, righteous come by the law. Mm -hmm. Christ died. That's right. If Christ died in vain, if that's the case. We're going to have to stop there and uh, close with a word of prayer. Brother Logan, good to see you. Would you lead us in prayer? And we'll dismiss our class with that prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for all the many ways that you bless us, God, and the blessings you give us. We gather tonight to worship you, to learn more about you, to God, be grateful for your word, Father. Uh, we thank you for your son, the sacrifice that he, that he gave for us, that we can no longer uh, live under law, but that we can live under grace. Father, I pray that we uh, do not lose sight of this fact. I pray that we live our lives in such a way that reflects this and yes. in such a way that, that reflects you. Uh, Father, as we go back out into the world uh, after tonight, I pray that we will uh, we'll be lights for you. We'll be that city on a hill, and uh, we can lead others to you. So pray that you forgive us whenever we fail you. Uh, thank you so much for your son. Amen. Thank you, brother.